production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the Bartlett Area Chamber of Commerce and its member A2H, engineers, architects, and planners, creating an enhanced quality of life for our clients and community. To learn more about A2H's services and markets, visit A2H.com. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. School budget cuts, school closings, and more tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by three members of the Shelby County Board of Education. We'll start with Miska Clay Bibbs. Thanks for being here. Chris Caldwell, thanks for being here again. And Teresa Jones, thank you for being here. Right. Along with Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. And so, Bill, we had Dorsey Hobson on. We'll start with a little overview of where people are and then get the feedback from the, from the board members here. Dorsey was on, I think, in February and had presented a kind of preliminary budget that looked at what? <clears throat> it was an $86 million deficit. That deficit in the budget he put forward this week is down to $27 million. Mm -hmm. Why don't you give just the highlights of what was at risk in that $86 million budget and how they, they closed the gap to, to where it is right now? Um, w what, what was at risk were some classroom programs, and there are still some things that, that are at risk in the $27 million million dollar gap. Um, Superintendent Hobson said that, that basically nobody is really happy about the $27 million that, that could be on the table here if the Shelby County Commission does not come through with some more funding for the school system. But he, he said that th this is a little bit better scenario. It includes $10.8 million in raises for teachers, and it, it saves clue teachers. It saves reading specialists in the innovation zone schools. Um, so, so there were some things that, that, that were able to be preserved. And much, much of the cutting was done. There were 183 positions in the school administration, 122 are unf already unfilled. So 183 job cuts, non-teacher, non-classroom, I think is how Dorsey is framed. Right, right. And, and, and the bulk of, of the $50 million here uh, that is involved to get to $27 million what was in different departments, a yeah. scenario of, of what would your budget look like in your division right. if we did 10, 15, 20 percent cuts, but not across the board. At that point, uh, the, the, the uh, superintendent and the staff then looked, okay, what should we do in your particular division? So it was kind of a, a, a hybrid of across the board cuts and then looking at each division in, in great detail. Right. And so, mm, Teresa, what, your take on this budget so far, you guys will start, you've been reviewing it, you'll start voting on it. Um, you know, is that, do you need to close that gap of $27 million or do you think you'll get that $27 million, <coughs> which for complicated reasons we'll get to is really $35 million to the county commission, right. but the $27 million you all need, do you think you'll get it? Have you cut too much? Do you need to cut more? Well, I think we've cut as much as we can without really affecting the quality of education at the classroom level. I don't think we are able to close the 27, and it's my sincere desire that the county commission understands that from our presentation and does uh, increase our funding. It, it's, it's hurting already, but to close that gap without extra funding will be devastating. And the, the reserves, last year the, the school board, school system, closed some of the gap that, that they had through dipping into reserves to right. 25, 35 million right. dollars. We How, did, we've got about 50 million reserves left right now? A, around that much, yeah, sure. but of course we can't keep closing the gap every year. And last year basically we, we probably kicked the can down the road for right. one year right. uh, with using those reserves. And that's not a good fiscal uh, way to handle budget shortfalls. And so we don't feel we can do that again this year. For, I'll put you on the spot, Chris, and you can defer if you want. But what is causing this constant gap? I think, I mean, what, why, why is this? I mean, the school is losing students to charter schools, ASD. The state is cutting back. I mean, what is causing such dramatic um, uh, drops in revenue or dramatic needs for more uh, revenue from the county? Well, it, it's basically, first of all, it starts with being underfunded by the state. So our county commission has to fund a greater portion of our budget than they do in other uh, counties. But then secondly, it's forced declining enrollment. It's, it's the ASD, um, you know, every time they take over a school, 
uh, um, that's revenue, the, the, the students, we lose students. Um, the, rule, the laws surrounding charter school operators and their ability to open, uh, and that's the second uh, most draining part. And even if we deny a charter, they can go to the state and then have that overridden. So it's mainly those, those two factors right there, and I think it's very similar to the case that Jim Strickland made about de-annexation, that there are certain costs that you can't get rid of fast enough, you know, uh, to to catch up with the loss in revenue from uh, you know the declining enrollment. Uh, but, I, get... but, but I can't say enough that it, it that it, that it's forced declines in enrollment. But how many how many charter schools are there, give or take? What, I think it was going to be up to close to 50. Does uh, that include 50? the ASD no. in that? No. Okay, so the 50 no. char independent charter schools. So the charter right. schools started however many, a decade ago or something like mm -hmm. that. ASD has now, what, almost 20, 15, 20 schools? Right. Is that right? Around 30. And and I think so we've got 70 schools. And do, we, do anyone know off the top of your head the number of students that involves? I'm uh, okay. understanding that we are probably 27,000 less and that's a combination of both. Of both. Okay. Uh, and so right. there's there's all that state money that travels with them that goes there. Right. And do, county money. And county money. Does does do the expenses not go now? I'll bring Miss Cannon and put you on the spot yeah. about numbers here. But do the expenses not go down proportionally? I mean, as those kids go to into the charter schools or into the ASD, that means less teachers. It means less services that are provided. Is it not a one to one transfer as those kids um, switch out? So in theory, a uh, great question, I will say this, as the newbie of the bunch and, and even my asking that question as, a, as I came onto the board, I think the reality of it is as kids exit, the reality of it is the money goes for the child, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they all, it's one whole classroom that leaves together. Right. They may come from particular classrooms as far as when we think about how you know, choice happens as far as you know, kids going to a charter or even going to choice around going to other school options. ASD is a little bit different because they do pick up the whole school, but the reality of it is as kids change, you still need a teacher to teach that classroom, right. regardless of the amount of kids that are in that classroom. So you still have those expenses that you have to take care of. And, and I'll get Bill in a second here, but the, it, does it not, I mean, you talked about choice and that mm -hmm. the parents are choosing or the state in the ASD case is, is forcing, mm -hmm. but in the charter schools, parents are choosing to send their kids to those 50 schools. Mm -hmm. So is that a bad thing? I mean, would you like that to, it's, it creates all these budget difficulties. So would you like to see that stopped, all that So choice? I think the reality of it is as SES, we have some excellent schools, some teachers that work really hard to be able to service our kids. But at the same time, we need to be very realistic about what we're offering and do and spend some more time really marketing about how great right. we are to be able to say hey we're, we're an option too I don't think we think about it until uh, quite honestly when you think about general choice or optional school choice fair that time period but the charters spend time marketing all year yeah. long I mean billboards and and all kinds of yeah yeah absolutely so as a parent then that child then exits the district so I think we need to do a better job of making sure we keep those kids. Yeah, Bill. Um, Teresa, C County Mayor Mark Luttrell's budget I includes basically taking the other half of the wheel tax revenue, some $16 million, and devoting those to school capital needs. Uh, there, there's been some discussion about whether or not the county commission should say <laughs> that $16 million could go for school operating needs on a recurring basis too since it's, it's since it's a revenue stream yeah. what what do you think about that is that a viable solution i think i think it might be certainly i would be in support of that uh, i know that we have dire capital needs but i also think there are other ways that we could fund those capital needs other <laughs> than that money so the wheel tax and i have uh, citizens ask me all the time, what happened to the wheel tax? What happened to the wheel tax? I think this is an opportune time to really step forward and put all of that money to uh, the school system, which it was designed for in the first place. CIP uh, capital is certainly a, a need, but there are other creative ways to fund that long term. And so if you combine that with the up to $8.6 million in new funding that the mayor has talked about right. in his budget proposal, right. you get to around $24 right. million on this. Right, which is still, you have to look at 20% that's mm -hmm. going to go to the municipality. So we're still not at the 27. We'll still have to, even if that happens, uh, we'll still have to go back to the table and find additional cuts. Chris, so I, I would just uh, say that it is very significant 
that they're trying to put the money in capital improvement funds because uh, I asked the, the CFO, would he rather have capital improvement funds or operating funds? He said, absolutely operating funds. Now the interesting thing is in the municipalities, they don't need any more operating funds. They need money for buildings. So uh, I think it's perplexing that, uh, um, that this, uh, this year, that's, decide that's what they're deciding to do with that. The other thing I would mention to you, there is a resolution where the, all the wheel tax money can be uh, uh, diverted to the schools. Last year, some of the wheel tax money went to service debt, and, and there was already money there to service some of those bonds. So my question is, uh, why are we over-servicing debt and underfunding schools? Yeah, yeah Phil. So, Miska, t talk to me about, about putting this budget together, because we, we've done some math here, and that seems to be very much what this amounts to, an, an amount here, an amount there, not just one move that, that knocks this all out. Um, um, I, I think as I listen to my colleagues around this, for me, it's originally when um, the superintendent came out and we had this huge number that was a, a gap, and then now to come back um, as of yesterday to kind of dole that down, ultimately, I just stand on, we've cut and cut and cut. Even before I was on the board and just paying attention, we have done so much cutting. At a certain point, we have to figure out how to stop the bleed because I, don't, I think we're at the bone now. And our teachers and our students are hurting in a way in which we have to be very you know, realistic about that we have to do something to be able to stop the bleed. Is one of the answers in that school closings? There, there, you guys have approved what the closing of three charters, is that right? Omni, uh, Prep, Lower, Middle, and Southern Avenue Charter. Yes. Uh, you're going to be voting on Carver and Northside High Schools and uh, Messick Adult Education. There was another right. list that, that Dorsey had put forward when we were in the $86 million deficit scenario. I think those are off. But is, are school closings <laughs> an answer to stopping the bleeding? Well, I don't, I think partially, but the reason those closings were proposed is because of the academic performance. Yeah. Now, obviously, there are some savings to be reaped with the closures of the, those schools, but that's not the main reason for it. But the, they're hand in hand, they go hand in hand. Is that, you, people have talked before about some of these schools just being a third empty, I mean, right, two thirds right. empty and so it's on. It's costly, so, it's yeah. costly and the academic programs that can be offered are not robust. Children are not getting the exposure, what they need. And so to put them in another environment is absolutely the right thing to do. However, uh, there are there are cost savings yeah. when you I don't think, have is it that. Four, four million, right. that, give right. or take, for Car right. Carver Northside, and, right. and so in the world you're in, not right. a, it's not a huge amount of money, but right. it's, it's it's millions of dollars. Right. You, do you think, Chris, that um, and you've been involved in this for quite some time now? We were talking before about all the convolutions of of, of the board and merger and demerger and so on. But are the charters held to the same standards, and are they, you know, as the the the, the the regular schools, for lack of a better term. I mean, are, is there enough oversight of these charters? Is this, closing these three, for instance, a, a kind of step forward of saying, look, we, we want to look more closely at the non-performing charter schools? Because some people have come on the show and talked about charters, and people nationally talk about charters being the sort of be-all and end-all, the cure to all the problems of, in public education nationally. Your take on how you guys manage the charter schools. So this was the first year that uh, the state allowed uh, school boards, LEAs, to close charter schools. Uh, they are rated the same way the states are. Now, what we found is the dispersion of the performance of those schools is no different mm -hmm. than, than the traditional uh, public schools. So the fallacy, and, and there are a lot of people that have drunk the Kool-Aid about charter schools, and the reality of it is there, the model does not guarantee success. And what it really boils down to is what I think we found in the I-Zone schools. It's a strong leader in the building, mm -hmm. effective teachers in the classroom, um, you know, um, interventions that are tailored to the students, and um, also, uh, you know, their studies aligning with the, what, the, what the test is going to be like. And then we had some things like a longer day, but really it's about ha also having the supports and, and that, the, that the students need. Which are sort of elements that people point to with charter schools, you know, that kind of broke the, the long, the, 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 the typical way that public schools were done is the I-Zone schools. There are what now, 15, 20 I-Zone schools? I, I'm no. doing terrible things yeah. with numbers today. I'm putting you all on the spot. I apologize. <laughs> right. 
Okay. But the I-Zone schools, there's been a debate a bit about these I-Zone schools, which have the extra funding and a kind of different approach versus the ASD schools. Mm -hmm. Um, your take on that fight, there was the Vanderbilt study that showed that the I-Zone schools were doing better. It didn't say that the ASD schools were doing terribly. It just said I-Zone was ahead Be for a variety of reasons. AS the, no ASD takeovers in this next year. Um, your take on, the, on that debate between which is better or is it we want both? I think it's absolutely the fact that iZone has proven that it has surpassed ASD and how they've done, um, quote unquote, transformation. I think um, Chris hit it on the nose when it talked about its leadership, its solid teachers in the building, and its understanding the community in which you serve. And I think that's why, um, along with you know, along with interventions, I get that. But you know, th it takes strong teachers and strong leadership to understand how to properly, you know. Um, execute interventions so that students are really performing it that way. I think, you know, with iZone having an extra hour, that, that's part of it as well, but the reality of it is making sure you have the right teachers and leadership in the building. When you say intervention, you don't mean intervention, I don't think, w with an individual child. You mean an intervention into a school that is low performing and, and a yeah, it's, I, I, it's I think a, a whole organizational intervention needs to happen at that school. Is that I, what you mean? Well, I mean, just when you talk about student achievement, I really mean intervention around understanding your children and where they are in the right you know, tools to be able to move them from point A to point C in, in a year, quite yeah. honestly. And that takes... Uh, a strong teacher, and that takes strong leadership in a building in order to be able to support that happening. And so everybody who comes on the show talks about how, including the, the head of the ASD, the former head, the current head of the ASD, talks about how great the I-Zone schools are. So somebody's out there saying, well, why don't we just make them all I-Zone schools? Correct. Teresa, why don't we just make every school in Shelby County an I-Zone school? Uh, I agree. Let's just make them all. <laughs> well, that was but a bad question. But there's a, there's a cost to that, yeah. and, and obviously... I think that uh, in the coming years, that would be the preferred model. It has a proven track record. I know the naysayers would say, well, they didn't get to this work, to this point with this work, without uh, the competition. And so the thought is, without the competition, then we would just go back and, and rest on our laurels. But I don't think that would happen uh, because of all the turmoil that's going on and our commitment to doing what's best for kids in terms of student achievement. So I would hope that the legislature and the State Department would see the value and not make it about ASD mm -hmm. versus uh, I-Zone, but a proven track record. And uh, I can't say enough about what uh, Miska said about understanding the community. I think one critical flaw was the state model started off, we're going to manage these schools, but ultimately it resulted in bringing in out-of-town charters that really had no connection with the community. Yeah. I think those are intangibles when you're dealing with children, when you're talking about understanding how to move children forward. Those intangibles can make all the difference in the world. And, and I'll go to both in a second, but a question when you talk about these I-Zones and charters and the, the better performing charters and so on, it's all, everybody talks about teachers and having good teachers and strong mm -hmm. teachers. Is, does the district do enough to, and I hate to say it in an ugly way, but get rid of bad teachers? I mean, any organization, private, government, whatever, has some people who, who maybe are underperforming. Is the school system, Chris, doing enough to get those, get in strong teachers and get out teachers who, who aren't performing? Well, when uh, we were a 23-member board, we passed mutual consent. And that allows uh, both the teacher and the principal to have to want to be in the same building or, or they don't have to be there. The state uh, basically neutered the unions because they can't strike. There's no collective bargaining. There's collaborative conferencing where we can listen to their grievances. So uh, those kind of things help. Uh, make sure that, that both those people want to be in the same building working together, the teacher and the, and the principal. So it has given us the ability because what you used to have would be some teachers that, um, that maybe weren't, were underperforming, knew they were going to be let go, so then they would quit, go back in the pool of teachers, and they would have priority and could actually bump a teacher with less seniority. Yeah. So those things are happening now. Uh, statewide. Those things are not, you're saying that has ended, that sort of practice, you have more authority. Yeah, yeah that, that uh, right, that, that, that what's happening now is that they can't bump other teachers, they go back in a pool and they then uh, if they quit and they don't have to be rehired, yeah. it's up to the principal. Okay, Bill. Um, we've talked about innovation zone schools, but you all have an empowerment zone coming up in, in, in Whitehaven. 
that that seems to me is is going a step beyond this. Looking at what you've done with innovation zone schools, looking at particularly at what has happened in Whitehaven, particularly Whitehaven High School. Mm -hmm. How important is is that? I think it's extremely important, uh, given the current uh, financial situation and the political climate. Mm -hmm. We know that iZone has a huge price tag to it. And I've said from the beginning, how do we get, begin to replicate those gains, those best practices without the price tag? Because ultimately that, that, that money may go away or may be shifted someplace else. So I think we have to apply the iZone model as much as possible to, um, that's the way we operate. And that's what's happening in, in the empowerment zone, given those teachers, principals, uh, uh, autonomy for a relationship to try to replicate those best practices that are working in the I-Zone on a uh, scalable level in those buildings. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Vincent Hunter, who is now the principal at Whitehaven High School, becomes the, the leader not just over that high school, right. but the schools that feed into Whitehaven right. High School. Right. What do you think about that as a structure? Um, so, uh, super excited about the idea of a strong empowerment zone in Whitehaven. I think one of the things, we do talk theater patterns often, but I think having an empowerment zone is actually putting it into action, being able to duplicate some of those things around iZone with uh, hopefully with some type of cost savings to it because the idea around iZone, yes, it's extremely successful, but it's also extremely costly. So let's look at trying to be able to do some of those same things in a different way. Um, for me, uh, it's very exciting to be able to do this with a feeder pattern. So then that way you're touching the life of the child from pre-K on up to high school. So they get an idea of what it is that is expected of them, not only just for the child, but for the parent and the community around them to know that strong leadership is happening at every level of education. So for me, that's why the empowerment zone is exciting. Mm -hmm. Vincent Hunter uh, is definitely a strong leader. And I think him being able to work with those principals who are currently in those buildings will probably, I know that he kind of um, quasi worked with some of them, mm -hmm. you know, but not necessarily in a quote empowerment zone way, but then now to know that he um, has been tasked with saying, okay, this is how we're moving forward. Right. It's a great thing. Chris, is this a model for the rest of the school system? Are there areas where, where you can't do this? Uh, well, I think what you're finding is that different things work in different situations. Mm -hmm. The I zone is primarily a turnaround model for schools that are in the bottom 5%. So, so we do have high performing schools. The optional program is a sign of that. And, and uh, so I, I think it's, it's really being flexible. I think that the empowerment zone makes a lot of sense. The collaboration all along the grade levels mm -hmm. is very important in, in the supports of the students. So um, I think that we need to continue to look. The other aspect to think about is what happens to those I-Zone schools that are no longer in, in the bottom 5%. In fact, we have some that have gone to the top 5%. So their needs are different at that point. So, that, so how you would address what that school needs because it, it's harder and harder the higher performing the schools are mm -hmm. to continue to get the gains yeah. that are expected. It, it, quick, you mentioned optional schools. People have mentioned it. Um, White Station High is maybe one of the, the best known, but there are optional programs within Central, within Granwood, within a whole lot of schools. Right. Um, it, people talk, and I've had friends who've done the sleep out <laughs> on a cot in a tent in the winter <laughs> to get. Uh, is, there an, go, is there an end in sight to that practice? Well... In reality, probably not. We've done a lot of, ch made a lot of changes trying to get parents to understand you really don't have to do that. Uh, our, our registration is online. Parents, I think because of the historical nature of how that they've developed that process is not our process, mm -hmm. they just believe uh, that's the only way to get to school. But it isn't necessary. It's not necessarily, but necessary, but I think parents believe it is and as long as they believe it is to your point of is it going to end i don't think it will a couple just a couple minutes left the tn ready test it was a statewide disaster what happened from your perspective um i think they just didn't anticipate the technology uh the change the timeline was too tight yeah. on a test of that magnitude and the stakes so high for kids for teachers for mm -hmm. everyone I think there should have been a two to three year rollout to just go ahead, roll it out, take the test without any, uh, right. uh, without it counting. 
And so then in maybe year three or year four, then everyone is accustomed to it and we could start uh, scoring and, 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 uh, and uh, make it be an accountable at that point. But it was too new. The needs were too great. Uh, the vendor obviously thought he had what we right. needed, but there are just too many variables. And this obviously. was a statewide issue, but did, did Shelby County Schools lose money on this? I mean, it did, or was this funded entirely by the state? I mean, it's... I, I, I have no. to divert a quiz, but I think many, much of the hardware, the, the devices, there was some funding, but they didn't fully fund it, fund right. it all. Right. I, I think there was an there was amount of money that was given to the schools to help us get computers, but, but that totally ignores the man hours that are involved to try to prepare for this. And, and that's one of the very things that teachers and principals are concerned about is the amount of instructional time mm -hmm. that's lost with this testing and then preparing for the test so that yeah. the teachers don't have enough time in the classroom to do what they normally would do. So, so there, were, there, was, there were plenty of costs to the districts okay. and it's just a shame that they didn't do a better job at the state. All right, that is all the time we have. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the Bartlett Area Chamber of Commerce and its member A2H, engineers, architects, and planners, creating an enhanced quality of life for our clients and community. To learn more about A2H's services and markets, visit A2H.com.